sing to the Lord as we begin our worship service, and we're glad that you have come to worship the Lord with us.
Father God, the song says that you are revealed in us, and so I pray, Lord, that that is a truth that we abide by and that we live for. God Almighty, I pray now that you will open our ears to hear, our minds to understand the truth of Jesus Christ. As we worship you, Lord, be blessed and make us a blessing, and let us receive, too, the blessing that you have for us and the commandment and instruction that you have for us today. Praise your holy name, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask the ushers, they'll come forward, and I just have a couple of announcements I want to highlight in your bulletin. Again, welcome to the Hibbing Alliance Church. We exist, we're here to prayerfully build relationships so that we can impact lives with the transforming power of Christ for the growth of God's kingdom. The two announcements I want to highlight, and then I'm going to ask you just to read the rest on your own. But following the service this morning, the Great Commission women will meet today following the worship service. It's kind of like a luncheon downstairs, and so all women are invited. If you are here and you're a woman, you meet the criteria. And so join the ladies downstairs, if you would, following the service. Also, we have a new Alpha course that begins Sunday, October 4th. In, on, uh, in the evening at 5 p.m. And the reason we want to start giving you this announcement now is because this is your opportunity to invite someone to come with you to discover and to discuss, even to object if they want to, about the uh, things of Christianity, the kind of class 101 on Christianity. They come for a meal, they sit down, they watch a teaching, and then they get to discuss what they've watched and how they respond to that and what their feelings are. And we are not going to try to correct them. That's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. We give them value by allowing them to express their questions or their objections or, or their agreements. And then we encourage them to con keep coming back and keep sharing what they are hearing and how they're responding to that. So that begins October 4th at 5 p.m. That'll be every then Sunday night. I encourage you to... Uh, begin preparing, inviting people to come and join you for Alpha. Other announcements are in your bulletin. Oh, by the way, I'll just say this. It's not even in your bulletin now because today's the first day. But today was the first day of Sunday school. If you just arrived this morning for church, you missed it. And, but the neat thing is, is you can come back next Sunday. And uh, today was kind of the introduction for everybody. We're kind of getting our, you know, who's in class and that kind of thing. And uh, it's been, a, I, 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 I'm teaching the men's class, and so if you're a guy and you want a class about what it is to be a, a solid man of God, how do you get there, um, then come to the class. It's at 930. It's uh, very informal. It's very, really good to be with the men. They're doing the truth project, talking about how does all things in life, whether it be theology, whether it be psychology, whether it be biology, whatever it is, how does that fit in with God? And it's a great class. And then there's a class in the book of Romans for adults. That is another one that one of our guys just said, that's how I came to Christ, was reading the book of Romans. And so we got some exciting stuff going on for adults as well as teens and children. So don't miss out, okay? 9.30 next week. See, one of the kids were clapping. Man, that was awesome. <laughs> All right. In, uh, Charles Spurgeon said this. Happy are we to have God's word to guide us. What were the mariner without his compass? What were the Christian without the Bible? This is the unerring chart, the map, in which every shoal is described, and all the channels from the quicksands of destruction to the haven of salvation mapped and marked by the one who knows all the way. Amen. We're going to talk about that um, reliable guide this morning. But first, let's pray. Father God, we come before you and thank you for the opportunity. Lord, we live in a country, praise God, still, where we can go to classes. We can not worry about someone looking through the window and are they going to turn us in for studying God's word. Thank you for this freedom. I pray that we take advantage of it, Lord, because that freedom it looks like is shrinking even in our own culture. I pray, Father, that we will want to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We will want to grow in our faith, that we will be the best person we can possibly be for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that when you call us, Lord Jesus, to be holy because you're holy, that we won't think that's a pipe dream, but that's a reality that we can experience as we learn about you and surrender ourselves to you. Father, we come before you this morning and thank you for all who are here. Thank you for the teachers now that have launched into these classes and the students. Lord, I pray that you will be with us as a congregation, that, that, Lord, we will support one another in prayer. We have so many people, Lord, that are suffering from sickness or from illness or from accidents. Some, Lord Jesus, dealing, grappling with some uh, mental health issues that are very private, and we may not even know about them, but, Lord, they're there, and you are the God that heals in every case. So we pray for divine healing. Lord, I think uh, Dave Mansky that many of us here don't know, but he works in our district office, Lord, and, and operates the church planting and the mission work. And Father, he's found out he has cancer, and I just pray, God, that you will walk him through that process. But, Lord, we pray for his divine healing. We pray, Father, that we will be a light into a world of darkness as individuals and as a church. I pray, Heavenly Father, that when we worship you, we do it freely. When we talk about you, we're not, we don't, we're not so worried about political correctness. We just mention who you are. Father, I thank you that we can give you our worship in music and also in the offerings, also in prayer, also, Lord Jesus, in studying the word and how we conduct ourselves day to day, whether it be in the public eye or in private. I pray, Father, that we will glorify you by raising up in our maturity by surrendering again daily those things that you call us to surrender so that God we truly are lighthouses of hope for the world because they see Jesus in us continue now Lord to speak to us as we worship you and as we hear from the word of God we pray in your wonderful and holy name amen
you, Lord. God, you are mighty and powerful, glorious, and deserve the praise of your people. Thank you, Father God, we pray in your name. Amen. Rejected and alone like a rose. 
Thank you, Father. Amen. You may be seated. When I was in junior high, my mom and dad, now understand, my family upbringing, I didn't live in a log cabin. That didn't come to my first pastorate, actually. But we, um, we, when we grew up, my mom and dad were um, seven kids in the family. My dad had a high school education, never graduated from high school, actually. His education came through the Army and the war. So consequently, um, he tried some odd jobs when he got back from World War II and then decided to go back in the military, so he was a full-time National Guardsman Army for his whole career. Didn't pay a lot back in those days, so he'd take odd jobs. And so my dad wasn't home a lot. Uh, we didn't see him a lot, I should say, because he was working other jobs. But he always made sure that there was food on the table and that we had the things we needed. And uh, technically, I guess, if you look back in those days, and many of you can identify with this, if they were doing a status report on your family in terms of how you meet in the social era of life, my family would be considered poor. We didn't know it. We, you know, we didn't know it. And that was because my mom and dad gave us great security as parents. But, you know, being the f number five and the number of seven kids, I wore the, you know, the waiter pants that were passed down from actually sometimes my sister, which was the oldest in the family. And so those were the kind of things we faced. So to get any kind of thing that had, you know, like other kids did, you know, let me try to put this in today's perspective. A lot of kids today uh, live in families that they have four-wheelers and they have motorcycles and they have snowmobiles and they have fishing boats and all those things are great. And I'm not speaking against that at all. But when you grow up in our family, number one, those things weren't as popular back then. And number two, uh, there was no way that our family was going to have any of those luxury items we had a car one and we got back and forth and I mean that's just the way it was that we didn't feel deprived it just didn't happen so when my dad and mom came to me one day in junior high early junior high and said Kevin we've been thinking and we want you to do better in school it wasn't that I couldn't do better it was that I just didn't care and, and uh, they recognized that, and they said, we, we want you to do two things. Number one, we want you, if you can improve in your grades, and if you can help a little bit more around the house without being asked to, not that that's ever a problem with a teenager, um, we, 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 we're going to try to provide for you as a gift a mini bike. Now, for those of my era, you know what a mini bike is. It's a, it was this little like box thing with two wheels and a motor, and it looked like a motorcycle. Only it wasn't a motorcycle. It was a mini bike. It wasn't a bicycle. You couldn't pedal it. It just you sat low and and put it around. It was it was the rave in my era. Um, it was what you guys have now. Motorcycles. We they had motorcycles, but kids didn't get those. Those were for adults. And so it's like, well, really, really. And yeah, we, we want to do that. We, we, we want to encourage you. We want to give you incentive. We want to give you a mini bike if you meet the criteria. Yeah. To this day, I have no idea if I met the criteria. I, I don't. Um, I obviously think I did. But things, because of our family situation, things change. And in life, kids don't see this, but adults do. And things change. The financial structure of my family changed. And at one point, my mom and dad had to come up to me, my dad, and say, Kevin, we're sorry, but we can't do the mini bike. I was crushed. It's like, man, I had all my hopes built on this. I was going to have a mini bike. I might even have let my little brother use it. Probably not, but it is a mini bike. And all of a sudden, it was taken away. Not because my parents didn't want me to have it, and I don't think it was even because I wasn't working toward trying to get it. It was the financial situation of that day at that moment dictated to my parents, this is, this is financially impossible for us to do. And so they had to break the news. They threw out this lure to a young junior hire and then pulled it back in before he could strike. 
and I obviously was disappointed. We are on an adventure of the Christian faith. As one plans for an adventure, the last thing we want is last-minute changes or unreliable travel guides. In that story, if you put it in a perspective on a trip, my parents were the travel guides. They were saying, this is how it's going to work, and this is where we're going to go, and this is going to be the end result. And not by their doing, but by just life in general, they could not fulfill that, and I, didn't, I never got to get to the end of that trip, so to speak. I never got to get the mini bike course it doesn't bother me today otherwise you know, I never bring it up right it, it it was something that you know it was one of those hopes I don't bring it up to my parents um, you know but it was one of those things that once in a while comes back goes, ah, I remember almost, almost getting that neat thing we find uh, that there is no last minute changes there is no reliable travel guide in God he is the reliable guide in our great adventure. We may not like the road that he takes us on. We may not like the, 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 the guide or the rule book that says you've got to do it this way. We might want to take a shortcut, and God says, nope, there's not a shortcut here. We're going to go this direction. And we might even think there's a shortcut in life. And we might even attempt to take that shortcut in life and go, I think I know better God than you do on this one. But there's not. There's only one reliable guide in the adventure of life. And that is God, and of course his word. We, not that long ago, when I talked about possibly doing this, Pastor Luke said, didn't you just talk about the character of God recently? And I said, yep, we're going to go back to it a little bit. Because in Sunday school, the, the kids' Sunday school, they're on a space quest. And for the few, first few lessons, they're going to talk about who God is is and so i want to kind of connect with that theme number one god is immutable that means there is no variation in god there isn't any surprises in god god is immutable he is unchanging he is the great i am and if i and if they started the lesson today this is where they started in exodus chapter 3 13 through 16 moses okay understand the scenario here moses lived 40 years with the Egyptians. You remember the, 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 he was in that basket in the river and, and the queen or princess, whatever, found him and brought him in and took him in as her own and raised him up for 40 years and he became next to the prince and, and he was a ruler in Egypt and then he heard some Egyptians talking and he didn't like what they were saying. They are being cruel to Israelites, which he was, um, and so he killed the Egyptian and then tried to hide his body and then it was discovered and then he ran. And then all of a sudden, he went from being a ruler to a shepherd in the desert. And while he was in the desert, he encountered God. And, and in a most miraculous way, there's a bush that's burning, and yet it's, the leaves aren't burning up, and the, 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 the stems are not burning up. And, and there's probably heat coming from it, uh, but, and, and there's flame in it, but it's not doing what fire does. And so he goes to see this thing, and then he hears the voice of God say, take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. That in itself would have put me, me in a position of, whoa, I, have, I don't know what to do here. Wouldn't it you? I mean, I've encountered God in prayer, but never like that. Never when there's been a visible flame and the voice of God booming and saying, take off your sandals, or tennis shoes, whatever. But that's the encounter here. So, so then God says, Moses, I'm going, to, I'm going to use you to go help set free the slaves, the Israel slaves that the Egyptians have in bondage. And that's kind of where we come into this passage of Scripture in Exodus chapter 3. And Moses says to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel. I'm going back to those who are captives of Israel. And I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Well, they may say to me, what is his name? And to me, I read this and going, well, he just said it. Didn't he? The God of Israel is sending me to you. And they're going to say, what's his name? What's the definitive statement that you can make, is what they're asking, that proves to us that you truly are from God 
and not just some religious fanatic. What should I say to them, Moses said. And God said to, them, to Moses, I am who I am. And in your Bible, it should be capitalized. My Bible it is. And everybody's Bible it probably is. I am who I am. In other words, you don't go any further. I am. This is it. Boom. Exclamation point. I am God. You don't question me. You don't wonder, well, is there another one I can go to? This is it. This is the creator of the universe. I am who I am has sent you. And that should be enough. And Moses, <laughs> thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you to me. And God furthermore said to Moses, Then you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. This is, if I can put it in our context today, this is the reliable guide, the one that will not set you wrong, will not take you on a wrong course, will not forget to pack certain provisions. This is the one and only that will provide for you everything you need in life to be faithful follower of God. I am. You don't need anything else. Oddly enough in that story, we're not going to get into that story completely, but oddly enough, Moses now feels comfortable enough to say, I'm not sure I'm the guy. And God keeps after him. And as we see, Moses definitely does obey the Lord. But when he says, I am... That's the point I want to land on. God is immutable. That word means that he doesn't vary, he doesn't change in his character, in his nature, and in how he accomplishes things. We can rely upon that. Charles Spurgeon was a preacher of old, and I'm going to read a portion of his message and take it right out of here. And the message of God that he was giving was the immutability of God. And here's what he says, because he says it so eloquently and so powerfully. God is Jehovah, and he changes not in his essence. We cannot tell you what Godhead is. We do not know what substance that is, which we call God. It is an existence. It is a being. But what that is, we, not, now, uh, we know not. However, whatever it is, we call it his essence, and that essence never changes. The substance of mortal things is ever-changing. The mountains, with their snow-white crowns, doff their old diadems in summer in rivers trickling down their sides, while the storm clouds gives them another coronation. The ocean, with its mighty floods, loses its water when the sunbeams kiss the waves and snatch them in midst to heaven. Even the sun in himself S-U-N, requires fresh fuel from the hand of the infinite Almighty to replenish his ever-burning furnace. All creatures change. Man, especially as to his body, is always undergoing revolution. Very probably there is not a single particle in my body which was in it a few years ago. This frame has been worn away by activity. Its atoms have been removed by friction Fresh particles of matter have in the meantime constantly accrued to my body, so it has been replenished, but its substance is altered. The fabric of which this world is made is ever passing away, like a stream of water. Drops are running away and others are following after, keeping the river still full, but always changing in its elements. But God is perpetually the same. He's not composed of any substance or material, but a spirit, pure, essential, an ethereal spirit, and therefore is immutable. He remains everlasting, the same. There are no furrows on his eternal brow. No age has palsied him. No years have marked him with mementos of their flight. He sees ages past, but with him he is ever now. He is the great I am, the great unchangeable. That's God. 
Why is that significant? Because if we're going on this journey of life, we don't want to put our trust into somebody that changes the rules along the way. We don't want to hear from God the Father that the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ, and then, and then along the way, it's like, well, if you just try hard enough, if you're sincere in trying to be good, then I'll let you in anyway. We cannot believe a theology that says, no matter what you believe, all people are going to heaven because God is unchanging. And God said, for the wages of sin is death. And the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. God is unchanging in his nature and unchanging in his counsel. We can't take the word of God and begin to tweak it so that we feel better about our activities because the old Bible said that wasn't a right activity. We have the domination within our own community and in many communities that they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God and so they've taken and they translated according to their translators that like John and the book of John which says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God referring to Jesus Christ, they've changed that so that it says, is a God. Recently, with this whole Marriage Amendment Act and so forth, we have, we have people who believe they're sincere, who are in the Christian faith, that are saying, you know what, we have, to, we have to be tolerant, and we have to accept people, and if people love each other, and they have to be of the same gender, well, well God loves them too, therefore we need to love them because they're in love to the point that they've written their own Bible. It has a cross on it, and that cross is colored in rainbows. And the Romans 1, story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all those indicators that homosexuality is an offense to God have been removed or altered so that we can live the way we want to live, and the Bible says it's okay. God is immutable. He doesn't change. Psalm 46, 1 through 7 says this, God is our refuge and strength. Hallelujah, he doesn't change. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God in his, is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. That passage of scripture was quoted by President Bush after 9-11. First happened in 2001. Two weeks after the disaster that we just remembered last week, 9-11. Two weeks, churches were packed full of people. Because the fear of God had been come to them in a most unusual way. Suddenly this nation called the United States was vulnerable to attack from the inside. And we didn't know how to handle ourselves. And so people ran to the only source of strength they knew of that could help them. Because our government and our military and our law enforcement did not and could not stop those attacks. What do we have left? And so the great nation of the United States, for a brief moment in time, bowed their knee and went to God and said, Help us. Spare us. And now, 14 years later, God, get out of our way. We'll write our own version of your Bible. But God is unchanging. The unique thing about that is, is God is merciful. 
God is loving. God is kind. He's just. But he's also forgiving. And the very people who are saying to God right now, we're going to change what you say or what you look like to meet our expectations that if we repent of that and, we, and, and, and folks come to him and say, I was wrong and forgive me of my sins, God is unchanging and he will forgive. He is a strong tower. He is our refuge and our strength. And even on this road of life, he is a very present help in trouble that we can count on. God is immutable. That word means unchanging. God declares that he is unchanging. In Malachi 3, 6, he says, I am the Lord. I change not. You can't get more specific than that. Right? God said, I am the Lord. I change not. It's not a concept that theologians come up with. It's God himself telling us this is who he is. 1 Samuel 15, 29. Also, the God of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. My parents' circumstances changed their mind. They did not want to tell me that. They did not want to break their, their agreement with me, but circumstances change their mind. God is unchangeable because he is the Lord of circumstances. He can change things. Things can't change him. But God doesn't change his mind. Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In other words, you're consistent all the time, consistently the same. Now, you might have an argument. This, this, this was not an argument, but in a, I was at a meeting here this week talking to someone from the Catholic Church, and we were talking about you know, stuff that's affecting the Church of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and I said, you know what we need is we need a, a great awakening in the United States and in the world. So that, because she was talking about the fact... I, you know, I know that, we've, that, that in history, like in Rome, they talked about the fact that maybe Jesus is coming back now because things are so bad. Nero is killing people and da 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 And then I said, in Germany, same thing, Nazism and Hitler was killing all these Jews. And, and everybody thought at that moment in time, because it was so devastating to the, to the world, that this must be the time that Jesus is coming. And she said, it feels like it again. The difference is, is that all the pieces of the puzzle seem to be in place. I said, yep, I agree with you. But God can still. I said, when God withheld his judgment was when there was an awakening of the church. And she went way back in history. And she goes, yes, Nineveh. I said, that's right. Remember the story of Nineveh? Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh and proclaim to them, God's going to kill you unless you repent. He's going to destroy your entire city. And the people listened. And they repented. And remember, Jonah got mad because God didn't wipe him out. Now the message was, well, God said, and Jonah said this to God, God, you said you were going to destroy them. You are going to wipe them out. You made me look like a fool because now they're still with us. God said, my message never changed. I called them to Repentance. But I said there'd be judgment if they didn't repent. And they repented. Therefore, they have been saved. That's the message God has for us all throughout the Gospels, all throughout the Scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation. It's a call of repentance. It's a, God, it's a call of mercy. It's a call of love. If people repent of their sins and surrender to Jesus Christ, those people will be saved and redeemed. But if they reject Him, then there's judgment. God is consistently the same. In Psalm 100, verse 5, we read these words, For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. There it is again. And His faithfulness to all generations. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
We have to have a reliable God. If we don't have a reliable God, our faith is hopeless. God reminds us again and again that he's merciful and he's unchanging and he's there for us and he will save us if we cry unto him for deliverance. See, God's unchanging blessings and consequences are first of all his unchanging attributes. Listen to his attributes. Listen to what makes up the character of God. Wisdom, holiness, love, justice, goodness, omnipotence, which means he's all-powerful, omniscience, which means he's all-knowing, omnipresent, which means he can be everywhere at the same time. And oh, the horror of our existence and future if these qualities vacillate. God also, his plans, Jeremiah 29, 11. I love this. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And God's plan is unchanging. God has promises. The prophecies of the old fulfilled in Christ. The promise of Christ to redeem the loss. The hopes of eternal glory with God in heaven. These are all promises. And if God is not unchanging, then we are miserable, discomforted, and lost. For there is no promise we can trust if God changes. We are on an adventure of the Christian journey. We do not know the way, nor the future. So we must believe and trust in our immutable and unchanging God, our reliable guide. I want you to pray with me right now. And I want to challenge you to recommit your life and allegiance to God. We understand if you've been in church and your church and you come here a lot or go to a different church that preaches the gospel, you understand the concept that God's unchanging. But we many times don't take time to focus on it. We just kind of like it's there and that's great. But it means that God has expectations for us. And those expectations and those commands are to be met. God is unchanging. He will not overlook it and say, well, that's okay, I'll let it go. So we need to come back on many occasions, but here's an opportunity of recommitting our life and allegiance to God, to surrender and trust our guide and follow His lead and obey His commands. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward as I pray and invite you to pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much that you are unchanging. Your word doesn't change. Your character doesn't change. Your existence doesn't change. There are many liars out there trying to make us believe that that's, that's not true, but God, you are unchanging. You are truth. Father, I ask you for myself and pray that everyone here will do this as well for themselves. That you will examine my mind and my heart. God, I I truly want to be a faithful follower and servant of the living God. I want to walk in the same way that you want me to walk. And you want me to live a life that's so consistent in Christ 
that people see me and I'm consistent and I'm unchanging because God, you are in me. So this morning I publicly pray and rededicate myself to you. I surrender to your will. I surrender to your love, to your justice. And ask, Father, that my life will be one that pleases you because it consistently demonstrates your unchanging personhood. Your love is amazing. Thank you, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you that you are unchanging. Thank you, O oh God, that in the midst of your majesty and in your sovereignty and your greatness and your magnitude, that you look down to this tiny little blue planet called Earth that you created and you see these tiny little human beings and you say, I love you and I'm here for you and my son died for you and I want you to live the glorious life of Jesus Christ on Earth for my glory and purpose. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Bless your holy name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. Go in God's peace.